Well, I'd like to start out by thanking um, Aubrey and the rest of the organizers for inviting me. Um, today, I'm going to present a fairly new project in the lab. Um, most of the data that I'm going to present is unpublished, but I've removed anything that any of my collaborators would be upset about me presenting in public. So if people are interested, I'm happy to have people take uh, photographs. Um, I slightly changed the name of, of my title. I, I'm going to be talking about um, unsnarling the autophagic traffic jam and attempts we've made to screen for novel therapeutics for all, for uh, neurodegenerative disease, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, the little joke that Aubrey made, I, I was originally, my first faculty position was at uh, University of Southern California in Los Angeles, so I spent a lot of time driving around there. Let's see if I can get this to go. Okay. Okay. Um, so, as uh, all of us are aware, um, autophagy is one of the processes by which our cells maintain homeostasis by regulating levels of organelles and proteins. And um, it's going to be tough with. And that process goes awry in a lot of age-related disorders, including those of the central nervous system. And this includes Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, ALS. Um, so age-associated declines in autophagy, um, which affect protein homeostasis, in turn can lead to neurodegeneration through this buildup of defective proteins, which form aggregates, and also buildup of uh, defective organelles like mitochondria. And uh, both of those things are associated with age-related neurodegeneration. And one of the key regulators of Autophagy is a transcription factor called TFEB, or transcription factor EB, um, which is involved in, hmm, that doesn't work very well either, in the end stages of, um, of the autophagic process during um, uh, Auto, when proteins and organelles are taken into the autophagal lysosome and degraded. So this transcription factor is a master transcription factor that's involved in, in thank you, in regulation. Oh, red one, okay. Ah, that's better. Okay, that's involved in um, upregulating many of the genes that encode proteins involved in autophagy and lysosomal function. So again, as most of us are aware, there's a seminal study um, showing that for the first time, um, barring diet restriction, the ability of a compound to an increase lifespan in a mammalian species, and this was via a compound called rapamycin, which inhibits an important gene, um, mTOR, which we know is involved in lifespan extension. And... Uh, we, in a study we published a few years ago, showed that late-life rapamycin feeding also was able to prevent age-related uh, um, Parkinsonian phenotypes in a mouse model of the disorder, and we found that that process was TFEB-dependent. Um, and over the last few either years, there's been a growing um, interest in the role of TFEB in neurodegenerative disease, and therefore as a therapeutic target for the disorder. And this led us to conduct a screen for inducers of TFEB, and through that screen, um, we identified a lead compound called C1. So the screen basically um, involved uh, transfecting uh, rat and 27 cells with a TFAB promoter luciferase uh, uh, construct, and then we used a natural product derivative library for the screening process and identified, uh, identified this compound C1, which you can see shows robust induction of TFAB. It's actually a better TFAB inducer than... Um, either uh, 
rapamycin or trehalose, which are sort of traditionally used as inducers of TFEB. And interestingly, there were compounds within the library that were very structurally similar to C1, um, for which we don't see induction, which is nice because it gives us a kind of nice structure function relation to get some bead on the chemistry that's important for this induction. And you can see here that there's a nice uh, dosage-dependent increase. Okay, so C1, and this is actually in human neuronal S5 by cells, C1 um, not only induces uh, TFEB, but it also induces um, TFEB downstream target genes, which is important. And in um, SY5Y cells that express human disease genes, so an SY5Y cells expressing either a tau mutation, um, the P30L mutation, or expressing um, TSC1, um, which produces tau through an mTOR process, we see in, in these cells, you see increases in, in insoluble phosphate tau that are reduced by treatment with C1. And also, um, this was the work in the TSC1 mutant cell lines was in collaboration with uh, Amy Coma at UCSF. Amy had lines expressing uh, this TSC1 mutant. These are three separate lines, and you can see a, a reduction on C1 treatment um, in insoluble tau levels. Okay, so at the buck. Uh, we use many different model systems in order to interrogate uh, both gene therapy and drugs. And one of the important model systems we use um, are C. elegans. Um, there, it's nice because they're actually an in vivo model, and you can knock out every gene in this organism. The lineage of every cell is known, and there's some nice uh, markers to look at different processes in this organism, including autophagy. And importantly, many of the genes and interventions um, for aging and age-related disease were first identified historically in C. elegans. Um, so turning to C. elegans as a model system, um, we looked at the effects of C1 on the warm homolog, which is known as HLH30. And you can see this is a GFP-tagged HLH30 uh, protein. With C1, we see an increase in protein levels, increase in mRNA uh, by qPCR, and uh, increase in protein by Western blot. We see some toxicity at the higher levels, which explains the lower um, levels of protein at the highest dosage. Um, the next thing that we wanted to look at, because we were proposing that this was an inducer of TFEB, is its effect on autophagic flux. And uh, for this, we used this reporter line, which has an M-cherry and then a pH-sensitive GFEP tag. Um, so when this uh, reporter is not degraded um, by the APL, you have a merged red, green, yellow color. And uh, upon auto in increased uh, breakdown of uh, the protein by the APL, um, you get degradation of the green protein, and uh, you see red. And here we see control worms, which are all sort of lined, out, lined up. This is kind of the tradition in the field. Um, and what happens when you treat the, the animals with C1. So you have this sort of yellow to red shift, and you can see that we shift from autophagosomes to autophagolysosomes, indicating that we have an increase in autophagic flux with the compound. And here are some other um, indicators um, with C1 treatment. Uh, you get um, an... Uh, an increase in flux, which if you knock out the TFEB homolog, you prevent. So that suggests that the autophagic, uh, auto APL flux is dependent on this TFEB homolog in worms. And also, if you look at levels of another marker, P62, um, you see an increase in mRNA levels, which is, P62 is TFEB dependent the transcription of that gene, and you prevent it by knocking down um, the TFEB homolog. 
um, looking at mitochondrial function. This is using seahorse analysis. This is in normal adult worms. Um, we can see that when we treat with C1, we don't have much of a, an effect on basal um, respiration, but we see a, a, a large increase in maximal respiration um, following C1 treatment. And also looking at worms that expressed human alpha-synuclein within the dopaminergic neurons. Um, worms, you sort of think it's crazy. I mean, looking um, at a neurodegenerative model in worms, but worms do have six dopaminergic neurons. And when you express alpha-synuclein in those neurons, you do get an age-related degeneration of those cells. And um, we found that when we look at the number of dopaminergic, these dopaminergic neurons, um, their loss in this model um, are prevented by treating with C1, and this is in a uh, TFEB-dependent manner because if we use HLH30 RNAi, you prevent this process. Um, you can also look at motor movement in this model, so number of thrashes per minute, um, so a motor behavior, and that's... Um, the loss in motor movement is abrogated by treating with C1, and again, this is in a TFEV-dependent manner because if you knock down um, the, the mRNA, you see that you're preventing that effect. And then looking at maximal mitochondrial respiration, again, um, looking at uh, N2 worms, basally, and then... Um, Maximally, you can see this, that C1 elicits this increase in maximal respiration that when you knock down um, the TFEB homologue, you're preventing this. So all of this uh, tells us that with C1, we're increasing autophagic flux, we're increasing mitochondrial function, and we're preventing uh, neurotoxicity that's associated with human alpha-synuclein I, I'm not going to show the data, but we also looked at several other um, worm models of uh, proteotoxicity. This is another sort of glory of the worm that it, mice, the lifespan is three years. Worms, the lifespan is two weeks. So you can perform these experiments rapidly before you move into mouse models. And uh, C1, we found, uh, also prevented... Um, toxic effects associated with human A-beta expression, both in muscles and GABAergic neurons within the nerves, um, effects of human TBT-43, which is an FTD uh, worm model, and also polyglutamine aggregation in a, a Huntington's model. Um, so we, we've identified an upstream um, target. We're working to get the paper out uh, to relay what that is, but at the, at the moment we, we um, are sort of uh, keeping that under our hat. Um, but knowing what the upstream target is, um, we were able to test in human SY5Y cells two different compounds that are structurally unrelated to C1 um, but elicit activation of the same target gene. And in those, uh, so here's C1, here's these two additional compounds, and these compounds um, also elicit TFEB activation and downstream um, genes. One of them, um, C1, we were generally using in the micromolar concentration, and one of the compounds we're getting efficacy in the nanomolar concentration, so much more efficient. And these compounds also reduce insoluble um, phospho tau levels in a dose dependent uh, manner in this PL uh, or P30L tau SY5Y human neuronal cell model. And uh, lastly, but not least, uh, looking at the same Parkinsonian mouse models, which we had previously shown, uh, rapamycin uh, was capable of preventing neurodegenerative effects, including loss of dopaminergic neurons, increase in alpha-synuclein aggregation, and motor defects, um, treating those mice uh, are administering in the feed uh, C1 in those animals, we see an increase, an increase in TFEB levels um, um, in these mice. And this is kind of a nice uh, model. These are mice that are expressing 
um, a, a human Parkin mutation. And they're nice in the sense that they don't um, show a phenotype till 16 months of age, which is sort of a, akin to the time you would expect to see the defect in human patients. It's a little difficult um, for the postdocs and students in the lab because you have to wait 16 months to observe this phenotype. But it actually, if you're trying to look at something that's related to aging um, in a mouse model, then you really want to look at something, uh, you don't want to look at something where you see a phenotype extremely early, early on if aging is what you're interested in. Um, and again, as I said in this model, you see loss of dopaminergic neurons, about a 30 to 40% loss which we um, could ag aggregate by feeding these animals a C1. This was feeding the animals for maybe a month before presentation of symptoms. We haven't really looked at what happens with feeding, co uh, feeding afterwards to see if we can reverse effects, but those, uh, those studies are in process. And we're also looking at intermittent feeding because TFEB is tightly regulated so that when you have an induction, you normally then have, have a decrease. And we're sort of looking at the effects of having, having repeated feeding and a repeated induction of TFEB to try to sort out dosage and, and timing of treatment. Um, and so, sorry, so this is looking at the cell counts, and this is actually looking at um, motor. We looked at various motor tests in these animals. One of the tests we use is our cylinder rearing. How many times, if you put a mouse in a cylinder, it, it rears, which is a, actually a pretty crude but um, good assay of motor movement. Um, it's, it's very low in the park and mutant mice, and you get an increase after C1 feeding in these animals. And this is many of... Um, the compounds that impact on TFEB, they impact on TFEB through mTOR-mediated phosphorylation, so it, it's a post-translational event. And this uh, compound's actually acting through a novel um, mTOR-independent event. So it's a, a novel pathway, a novel mechanism. Um, so lysosomal rejuvenation, enhancing... Um, the function of the lysosome appears to be one effective therapeutic target for combating neurodegenerative disease. Are there other targets in relation to other autophagy-associated uh, functions that are worth exploring? Um, so here's, you know, the, the process of autophagy um, from formation of autophagophores and then you have a fusion with the lysosome to form the APL. And so processes upstream of um, increasing lysosomal function would include APG formation and also fusion of the APG with the lysosome. And so we wanted to have a way to look for compounds that were impacting um, on those mechanisms as well as uh, lysosomal function. Oops. And uh, fortunately for us, there was a... Um, probe that was recently published in which uh, you have GFE tagged to LC3. LC3 is important for um, taking proteins or marking proteins um, for degradation by the APL. And connected to this GFP tagged LC3, there's an RFP tagged with a mutant LC3. And within the cell, you have uh, natural proteases that cleave this into the GFP LC3 and um, RFP. The GFP LC3, because you have a functional LC3, will be taken up into the autophagosome and, the, and into the autophagolysosome, and you get degradation of the GFP, the green signal, while the RFP is not taken up and it's used as an internal control. And um, so we retrovirally trans infected um, the neuronal cells, SY5Y, with this construct, and we drug selected, and then you can actually fax sort on uh, the green-red fluorescence, and we did this in the absence and presence of, um, of autophatic injection starvation and are using various compounds that are known to increase autophatic flux, and then uh, validated that we had positive clones through PCR analysis, and uh, this is a, 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 a 
project that's ongoing, um, but funded by the SEMS Foundation. So I wanted to, if I can get this to go through, I wanted to be able to report um, that we now have clones available for screening for drugs that enhance or actually reduce autophagic flux. And the top hits from those um, will initially, we plan to validate them in these human neuronal P30L tau SY5Y cells. Um, for their ability to prevent a reverse in, in uh, insoluble phospho tau formation before we take them on into more complicated IPSC uh, organoid, human organoid models or into mouse models of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. But it sort of gives you an idea of the kind of screening processes um, that the laboratory is undertaking. And I think that's the last, oops, last slide. And uh, I just want to end um, by thanking the people in lab who are involved in this. Shankar was a former staff scientist in lab who now has an independent lab at a nearby university, Toro, um, but we still work in collaboration. Very talented postdoc in the lab, Manish Shamoli, who did uh, pretty much all of the worm and most of the cell culture work, and two very talented uh, technicians, Anand and, and Rena. And lastly, but not least, I'd like to uh, thank my um, partner in science and in life, Gordon uh, Lithgow, for, uh, Gordon and I are buried, we're both at the Buck, we've been there 20 years, and, um, we were, we were doing totally separate science until two or three years ago when he finally convinced me that C. elegans was a good model <laughs> to use. And I'm really now in love with the worms <laughs> because they're so rapid. And uh, now we're, we're doing uh, a, a lot of collaboration. And I think that's kind of the epitome of what the buck is like because um, we're, we're very extremely, extremely collaborative. Um, and it's a great place to do science. Thank you. Julie, that, that was, uh, I'm here. That was really nice. And, and uh, yeah, thank you, Gordon, for letting you do the. <laughs> so this is my question. How, how specific this pathway is to neurons? When we use, you use the drug, do you increase autophagy everywhere? What happens to the lifespan of, of the nematode? And uh, is it uh, additive to DAF2? Or, you know, did you do any of the aging parts of that? That's several questions. <laughs> um, it does increase, our treatment with C1 does increase uh, lifespan. We've done a little bit of dual. It doesn't seem to be... DAF2 or DAF16 dependent, but it, it, it is hmm, the upstream target. There is a, a DAF homolog, so it seems to be acting through that mechanism. It's not specific to the neurons, but, it, but it's pretty clear with TFEB, um, the substrates, you do have some specificity, so the hope is that either through neuron-specific delivery or through targeting um, specific substrates, we get some selectivity. Yeah. Hello. Here. Um, Thanks. Great talk. Here. Where, where are Just you? Just in front okay. of you. So <laughs> okay. you mentioned the number of uh, diseases related to protein aggregation, TDP-dependent, PolyQ, repeat-dependent. My question is, do you see a clearance of these protein aggregates with your compounds? Uh, yes. I mean, most of these C. elegans models, um, so for example, in the A beta models, the readout for protein aggregation is uh, uh, the number of bends that the worms make. And so with that readout, we do see abrogation of the phenotype. You do see, and so for example, in the, the alpha-synuclein worm model, um, you see loss of these six to eight uh, dopaminergic neurons, mainly the neurites, so you're counting on that. So each model, um, you're looking at a, a particular readout, but it's tied to the human protein aggregation, the aggregation of A-beta. A um, ALS, I think it's a lifespan 
effect. So they're all kind of surrogates, but they're well established to be associated with protein aggregation. So did I understand correctly that uh, C1, the natural compound, hits your novel target directly, and these two additional compounds you'd identified hit an upstream target from the novel target? No. Okay. <laughs> so C1 actually is hitting an upstream target of TFEB. And once we figured out what that was, we went and we tested drugs that are hitting that same target, and they have the same effect. And is there any reason to, and do I understand from your answer to Dr. Barzilai that that, is, that target is a DAF homolog? It's, it's not necessarily a DAF homolog, but... <laughs> it's not Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, the two novel compounds, is there any reason to favor those other than IP? I'm sorry. Is there any reason to favor the two novel compounds other than well, IP? Well, so one of them is, is much more selective in terms of the pharmacokinetics. Um, but when you're, th when you're thinking about CNS disorders, you always have to consider uh, uptake into the brain, correct? So there probably would need to be